from prison, Paul wrote with great passion. I urge you, he said, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Make every effort, he said, to those who had been saved by grace. In other words, work really hard at it. That might sound kind of strange in our Lutheran ears, grace and effort, but not to Paul. For Paul, grace was certainly not opposed to effort at all. Grace is opposed to earning God's favor because of the effort. But this faith that we have been given, it requires a God-empowered effort so that we grow up into Him who is the head, Jesus, so that we become mature and fully, fully formed in Jesus, so that your life in your behavior, your attitude, what you do, what you do not do, it all looks more and more like Jesus every year that you are on this planet. So that you do become in the humility of Jesus, the gentleness of Jesus, the, the patience and how he bears with us. This is then lived out of your life. Jesus is living out of you. So Paul would say again and again to this group of Christians in Ephesus and then at Rome and then in different and various places where he would be speaking, he said, I, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, the days of just drifting along with everyone else in society is over for you, but you are being changed from the inside out by Jesus so that your lives truly are different. The rest of the world is on this mad dash for happiness and success on, a, on a, a whirlwind tour so that they might receive all the affirmation and accolades that they can, but not you. You are on a pursuit that is new and totally driven by God in His grace so that you might have God Himself and His way of love in your life. So I'll just be as blunt as I can. How's it going? How is this ongoing effort going in your life? Are you truly becoming, over the years, a person who is being changed from the inside out by God in such a way that other people are noticing the change, like the people closest to you that live in your house, that worship with you in your church? Are you becoming a more humble person in a humility in such a way that uh, it is a self-forgetfulness where the other person is the most important? Are you becoming more gentle even as others become more irritating and agitating and contentious? Are you becoming a more patient person with your children Are you burying, burying with one another in love? We have spent the last 10 weeks with one another, learning, practicing what pleases the Lord. Have you put in the effort to do the practices? And if you have, will you continue them? Several years ago, I was in a small group with some really close friends, other church workers, and we were wrestling with this very question of transformation and, and growing up and being mature in the faith. And in the small group, we asked one another, well, well what if we don't put in the effort? Now, keep in mind, these are church workers asking this question. What, what if we just didn't, you know? 
Well, what if we didn't do anything more than what we're currently doing? And then some wiseacre said, well, what if we did even less? What then? What, what God's not going to let us into heaven now? You know, are we denied at the door because, oh, you didn't do enough good works? Well, that doesn't sound right at all. And so in that small group, I have to admit, there was not a lot of collective wisdom. and that We really didn't come up with a good answer because we all knew and preached and talked about and taught in Sunday schools that your, your place in heaven is 100% secured by Jesus. His work and his efforts have, have provided everything for you, even if you're not really all that humble or kind or gentle or self-controlled, or whatever sin that's your pet sin. Jesus has provided it all. And so I have to admit, at the time, I did not have a great wisdom to bring into that group, but, but today, I do. I know. It's always exciting when that happens. And ah, So the, the person... Man or woman who's ever thinking to themselves, well, why do I need to put in the effort? You know, what? when I get to heaven, it's all been provided. Why, in the end, it's not going to make any difference? Such a person who's thinking such thoughts and operating with that kind of mentality, you know what's really going on in such a heart? Because that heart is being revealed by such a statement. Such a person believes that they are still in charge of their lives and not God. Such a person prays when they feel like it. And, and they give their time and their talents and their treasures when they are convinced of a worthy cause, like passageways or the church's ministries or whatever. Such a person comes to the worship service for the joy and the peace that just naturally comes from such an activity. Such a person really values a sermon if it feeds them, which usually means it entertained them. Such a person will serve in a congregation if they feel the love from the members. No love? No service. Now, if you have kind of felt maybe you are in some of those examples, these were hypothetical, okay? But I was that person. And I still am that person who still kind of thinks along the lines that maybe I am still in charge of my life and the world. And that's the reason that St. Paul said transformation involves the renewal of the mind. It has to do with your thinking and what you're believing in your heart. It, has, it involves a great change then in that thinking. Now, this is a critical first step, but it's not the last. Because if it were simply no one better, we could clear things up right here and right now with a few clarifying statements of fact like, you're not God. Like, you're not in charge of your life or the world. You don't make the rules, nor are you above them. There. Done. Of course, we all know that. And so it's not a matter of knowing better because we're not instantly transformed by that information. See, the real deal and the problem isn't that we... We, well, I didn't know I wasn't in charge. God, you're in charge. Because what we really want is that I really want to be in charge. I really want to be God and in charge of me and the life. And, and this desire is so strong and so overwhelming and so overpowering that I don't care what I know. I will just live as if it were true. Now, how do we normally look at people who are living as something is true that's not? Right? It's like, you're pretending. All right? You're delusional. And yet, that's how we live. 
And these desires then to, to actually, you know, have my way are so big and, and the have-tos and the wants of life must be satisfied that, well, I'll just go and, and get them however, whatever means are possible that I may need to manipulate you. I may need to lie to you. I may need to just put on my best face so that's what you think I am. I may need to actually have a group of people that I love and a group of people that I hate. I may need to have all kinds of sins running this so that my desires are satisfied. In fact, these desires have been running large since the very first man and woman looked at a tree in which they perceived they could be like God and the fruit was desirable and they ate it. And from that moment on, desires have been ruining lives as we have wanted ourselves. In fact, it has been such a devastation on the entire planet that there is a world religion that, uh, that has arisen from it to answer desires. And that's the whole point of the Buddhist philosophy is that you take whatever desire, good or bad, and you just become nothing. You get rid of it. And then there is the nirvana. There is the perfection when you become absolutely nothing. The rest of the world religions say, well, that's no good. We can control this. We will put the clamps down on all these desires because your desires are leading you into all kinds of trouble. So we will, we will you have all these rules and morality and shame and guilt and we'll, we'll put a, a clamp down on that and fix it. How interesting that when God comes to change us and to transform us, he doesn't use any of these proposed solutions. It's not about getting rid of your desires or controlling them through guilt and shame and rules. His answer is to transform you because desires are a very good gift from God. Think about it. There's a piece of chocolate cake in front of you. What do you want? And that's a good thing. There's lots of other desires we could mention, but it's all good as God has given to them. The problem is when desires make terrible masters. They make great servants, but terrible masters. God made us to desire, and, and, and they made that desire to be big and wonderful and good, and he made it so that he would be our ultimate desire, and that all of our desires would be redirected and directed from him and what is good and right. And so how does he do that? How does this transformation work in us? It begins with a really simple question. What do you want? I mean, if there is cake in front of you, I want the cake. See, it really takes more deep thought, though. It's a simple question, but you have to realize that you want, and you want, and then you want, and then you want, and then you want. What is the deeper want? And as you drill down into what you really want, as you find that, God, I really don't want you. I really want myself. I don't want you that close. I, 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 don't, I, I don't trust you to take care of me. Those are the very places that God is working his transformation. And this, this is where knowledge and information is really helpful and where your efforts come into play. So that the more that you know from the scriptures, of, of actually bringing them into your life on a very regular basis and meditating on them and studying them, the more then you know how good God really is. And that he is that father who's always looking for the son to return. And when the son returns... His father's arms are open. When you really learn from the scriptures that God is not this horrible judge 
just a little bit upset with you all the time and just waiting for you to mess up one more time so that his wrath can come down on you, but rather he is Abba Father, your dear Father. And that you are his treasured possession and that he delights in you. The more that you learn that God is your refuge and strength, that he is powerful and that he is holy and he is He is God, and He is good. The more that you have put the effort into learning, the more the Holy Spirit has of you to transform into a person that truly desires that God to be my God. That this Abba Father be my Abba Father. This is where the rules and morality are really helpful. And your efforts of putting the the time into the spiritual disciplines comes into play. Because when you've been through this training, this ongoing training of of silence and solitude and fasting and submission and and service, lots of S's, it was easy to remember. But you you get the idea of all of these uh, of of withdrawal, of refraining, but then giving yourself. It's just training the the habitual uh, habits of life, making more of you available for the Holy Spirit to transform your normal habits into what you normally do to look more and more like Jesus. See, the habits don't make you spiritual. They don't make you good or in with God. They're just training what you've been normally doing. You've been conformed to the world. Well, now this is conforming to God. And the Spirit takes all of this, and you truly do, over time, under His grace and power, look more and more like Jesus for the sake of others. So it is a knowledge, it is It is an effort to do what you know, and then it is the will and the desires. And that's what the spiritual practice is for this weekend, for however long you want to do it. But the take-home card is all the practices, and then I left a space for you to write in your name. There's something good and holy about intentions. This is what I will to do. Now, it might just be that you would want to be the kind of person who would want to do this. I mean, maybe that's where you're starting, and that's okay. Lord, I just, I just want to be the kind of person who would do this. But when you sign your name, and, and maybe you are going to show this to your spouse or someone, say, you know what, this is my desire. The Holy Spirit is at work transforming and changing you so that your connection to the vine, Jesus, and you as a branch, you're feeding off of the kingdom resources of Jesus, his love, his grace, and you, you, dear child, forgiven child, loved of God, Grow up into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. Amen.